Due to its length, this episode of Beyond Reality Paranormal will be divided into two segments. This is the first of two. The night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go Beyond Reality. Our guest tonight, Caroline Corey, will be with us, a filmmaker. She has a new film out that's called Superhuman, the Invisible Made the invisible made visible and the thing that's going to be really interesting about this and sorry about the description in twitch i didn't get to change it so that's incorrect we are talking with caroline Corey tonight but the thing that's interesting about this particular documentary film is that caroline went through great lengths to use scientific evidence in support of psychic phenomena and greater consciousness and she shows it in the film she shows these experiments as they're done it's a really great documentary if you're interested in psychic phenomena like telekinesis and remote viewing, psychokinesis, um, ESP, anything that has to do with uh, psychic type abilities. This is a great film. and We're going to have a great conversation with Caroline when we bring her in. Uh, another thing that I, I failed to mention last night, and I meant to, and I'm not even sure what day it was now because I had this note here and somehow I missed it. But um, we lost a, a great uh, a musician and a great American hero a couple days ago. And, of course, I'm talking about Charlie Daniels, best known for The Devil Went Down to Georgia, just a classic song. And, in fact, in Booze, Brews, and Bros, we're going to have a bit of a conversation about that Friday night. I'm looking forward to really getting into in-depth with my bros as we talk about the career of Charlie, Charlie Dan Daniels, but particularly the song The Devil Went Down to Georgia. He did another song that I think is really, really appropriate today. I don't think it was a big hit, but it was a song that uh, I, I made a, a real direct connection to, and it was called In America. You may or may not know it. At the end of the program, I'm going to play that song to end the show. Um, and I have a, a, and the funny thing about it is that um, I was just sitting here flipping through these, these boxes of 45s that I've got here, the records that I have here. And I happened to flip along and I found the Charlie Daniels song that I'm talking about. I hadn't thought about it until I saw it. I'm like, wow. And not only is this a song that I really connected to, the reason I connected to it is because the message it sends is really powerful and it is could be uh, just as true today as it was when it was released in, I don't know, 1980, 1981, two, somewhere in there. And when you hear it, you'll know why. So anyway, a lot of great stuff coming up. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. It's free, of course. And go to the Twitch channel as well and follow us. That's free. We'd like to have you subscribe to the Twitch channel as well. There's a fee for that. But if you have Amazon Prime, it's free. You just have to connect your own Amazon Prime to the account. And if you go into the chat room in Twitch and type exclamation point Prime, it'll tell you how to, exactly to do that. Um, but following us on both of those platforms is a great idea because our weekend shows will be Twitch only eventually and our Monday through Thursday shows will be YouTube only also. So great stuff coming up though. Tomorrow night, I am not sure what's happening. These Thursday nights have been a little funky as uh, we hit the 4th of July season here. Um, we have some guests shuffling going on, so we'll see what happens. But Friday will be a booze, brews, and bros. On Monday night, Alexandra McCollum will be here to talk about and channel Golden Arrow. What is Golden Arrow? You'll find out Monday night. And then Tuesday, Wendy Williams, who was supposed to be here, uh, was it Monday night this week? I think so. We had an issue. We couldn't do it. Uh, she'll, she'll be on next Tuesday, Tuesday night, to talk about regression healing. So we'll be able to have that conversation. So good to see you all with us in our chat room. Uh, love having you along with me for this ride every night. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you as we can during our conversation tonight. Of course, as always, feel free to ask questions in the chat room. If you're listening as a podcast listener, thank you for doing that as well. Please share all of this wherever you happen to listen to the program. Share it on your social media. Let more people know about the program. We can get some new names, new faces into our chat rooms and as part of our group. I guess that's all the preaching I need to do. Let's go to break. Let's get our guest, Caroline Corey. Let's get her on the phone and let's have this conversation. It's beyond reality. I'll be right back. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. We've talked about some of these topics quite a bit over the course of the four years of this program's history. And never have we talked about these topics with someone who has gone to such lengths to put together a documentary film that not only 
discusses things like telekinesis, psychokinesis, um, remote viewing, and other psychic-type abilities, but actually offers illustrations of experiments and demonstrates the results of those experiments to support these discussions. And I'm talking about our guest tonight, Caroline Corey. She's an award-winning filmmaker, a futurist, and a visionary author. She's got best-selling books on consciousness and energy medicine. And uh, we're going to be talking about her film tonight that's called Superhuman, The Invisible Made Visible. Caroline, welcome to Beyond Reality. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Davey. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. What I loved about Superhuman was the effort you went through, not just to talk about experiments, not just to throw statistics at people, but to actually demonstrate how much of the work is done to support some of these ideas. Uh, it's really remarkable work. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's exactly the point of this film, because as you were just saying, there has been so much talk about our consciousness, the mind creates our reality, the mind affects our body. You know, it, it's, it's almost a given now. Even doctors tell us, you know, your mind, your state of mind affects your health and things like that. So I didn't want to just rehash the same thing. I wanted to not just uh, talk about it, but show and demonstrate how that is possible. So that was exactly the purpose of the film. Well, you, you hit a home run with that. And uh, tell me about the genesis of the film. Uh, and I, I want to separate the genesis of the film with how you developed an interest in the topic to begin with. But just tell us about the genesis of the film. Well, it actually, it's kind of both questions are connected, really, because okay. uh, I've been in this field of study consciousness for the past 20 years and, uh, you know, giving lectures, teaching, uh, doing all kinds of, uh, you know, kind of workshop type things and books. And I realized that a lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to, you know, sit through a class. They don't want to read a book. They just want to learn in a different way. And so, and, you know, as I've been saying, you know, this topic is so important. Um, the connection between the mind and the body, the connection between the mind, the physical world, and the non-physical world. Um, we know there's a lot of experience experiences, but we don't know how these experiences are happening. So I decided after teaching and lecturing and writing books, you know, I got to use a medium that's easy for people, that's fun, you know, that's entertaining. And that's the reason why I, I thought I, I need to make a film. <laughs> Did you know going into the film, I mean, you were already convinced. You, you didn't go into these experiments not expecting what the outcome would be because you'd already had some experience with this. Yeah, exactly. In fact, that's how it started out for me. In fact, when I was five years old, I had my first uh, very, very powerful experience. I um, realized that I could see the subtle energy. I, um, I had an experience where I saw beings standing there, and we were communicating telepathically, and they were kind of showing me how telepathy works and how you stay connected to the spirit realm, even though you're in physical form. It was amazing. And so, of course, I was five years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, everybody does that. It's no big deal. Um, and, and also the experience was beautiful. It wasn't scary or anything like that. So that because of that experience, I was very open and I stayed very open to the idea that, hey, we are connected to the non-physical, non-visible realms, and uh, we can continue that communication. That connection is never severed. So because I stayed open to that idea, I, uh, I, I got into, uh, I started asking questions, yes, but how? <laughs> I want to know how, you know, yeah. not just that it happened. Um, I want to know the mechanics of what did my brain actually do to be able to see things that others couldn't see, to hear things, to suddenly, spontaneously uh, speak telepathically, like, hello, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so when I started asking these questions, of course, I was going down the rabbit hole, but <laughs> eventually things started to make sense. And, um, and I also brought in a lot of, I think, memory with me coming into this life, I have to say. So I started to understand 
the bigger story, if you will, like the parameters within which we operate. Um, so the connection between the visible, the invisible, the physical, non-physical. And I started to see the construct of consciousness, how different people have different construct and how it's all connected within a larger construct. So all these kind of mechanics started to come together, and um, which it really, when you read the books and you go through the teachings or whatever, um, after, of course, 20 years of research and working with many individuals as well, it starts to not only make sense, it literally explains everything, we're, you know, you are being talking about, telepathy, UFOs, apparitions, all kinds of stuff. And so, uh, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> my, I think I was just asking you the genesis of the film, but you were also talking about how you, oh you personally God, became yeah, it. No, it's all, gr- it's all great. But one of the things that I really liked and I found a lot of meaning in, it was something that you said, uh, and if I have the quote right, it's something like, uh, I put my hand up and I could hear their thoughts. Yes. As a as a child, you were doing that, and um, like you said, you thought it was normal. You thought every five or six or seven year old child could do that, and I find it very interesting that people who really are are really in tune with these sensitivities and they were had them as a child say the same thing. They think everybody is born with this, and it's not until they're told later on. In some cases, they're punished for saying you know for using these things, or they're 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 embarrassed uh, for using them. Uh, so they kind of kind of withdraw and they turn it off as best they can. Um, did you have to do that? Yeah, no, exactly, because the experience that I had when I was five was so beautiful. I mean, I literally saw these beings, and I saw my connection to them. It was like home. It was like, oh, my God, thank God I know where I'm from type thing. Yeah. And so because it was so beautiful, so comforting, and it felt very safe, um, that, and like I said, like you said, um, I thought, oh, you know, everybody does that. So it, it just felt familiar and normal that I just didn't talk about it. And because I didn't talk about it, nobody told me, oh, you shouldn't do that or you shouldn't, you know, like there's invisible friends, you can't do that. Um, so it kind of stayed with me and I didn't have to shut it down. But I think what happens is that um, it just kind of, you get busy, you know, like you get focused focused on school and whatever, growing up, you know. So you get distracted a little bit, but I I I was always kind of questioning what's beyond, you know, what's behind what this person is saying, what's behind. Um, I could kind of see the energy, for example, somebody would come in the room and they say, I don't know, they they were struggling with something or they were chronic... um, uh, you know, things they were struggling with, like migraines or whatever. And so I would just look at them, and I would literally see the information behind them that created their problem. And so and I would hear their thoughts, like how they literally created that information and put it in their cells to create that migraine. It was very, very precise, kind of weird, but... <laughs> And so when I would tell them about that root cause, like, yes, for example, in this person's case, it would be something like, well, when you were seven, you had a drowning experience, and so because of that, you're, you know, you you hit your head and blah, blah, blah. So they would be like, well, how did you know? (laughs) And so, so, and then I would hear the thoughts that created that trauma. And so, so that's how I knew I was doing that. But to me, it was playful. It was fun. And so I just kept doing it whenever I had the opportunity. So I never shut it off. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things you introduce early in the film is a quote from Einstein. And, it, and the, the gist of it is, energy is everything. How important is that quote and that view from one of the world's greatest thinkers? This is so incredibly important, and that's also one of the biggest discoveries I've made, not just as a theory, just as a quote or as a concept, as an experience, and that's very, very different. And that's exactly part of that first experience I was talking about when I was five. I could see literally that I was an extension of 
those spirit beings. It's almost like I was on one side of the veil in physical form, and they were on the other side of the veil in non-physical form. But there was no separation. It was like the same spectrum. On one side is the physical, on the other side is the non-physical. And the only difference was vibration. So this means that it's not two separate things. It's not two separate worlds. It's one world. And on one end, it's a lower, slower vibration that gives us the illusion of being static and finite and material. And on the other end, it's vibrating so high that it gives us the illusion that it's not there. So, so because of that, you understand, you experience that it's all energy. It's not, you know, finite world and then the rest is, is, is an energy is something different. It's all different forms of energy. In fact, I say um, all existence is energy which manifests in infinite forms. That's in my book. <laughs> I may um, I may reveal a little bit of ignorance here, but isn't Einstein's equation E equals MC squared uh, saying the exact same thing, that everything is energy? Yes, yes, exactly. But there's also, I mean, he was also, uh, I mean, there's a whole conversation about uh, quantum mechanics. He didn't approve, I mean, he didn't agree with quantum right. mechanics. And I'm, br and I'm bringing that up because that is um, the way energy actually operates and functions and interacts and exists. It kind of how it, uh, it connects. It, it exists. It interacts with each other. So I feel like Einstein had that. Uh, correct, but I think in terms of the mechanics, um, this is where quantum mechanics, you know, I think kind of fills in the gap. And even quantum mechanics has its own uh, discrepancies also, but it's, at least it's, it's a, both together, they kind of complete a bigger picture, the bigger story. Let's go through some definitions so we know exactly what we're talking about. You use the word parapsychology quite a bit in the documentary. What is parapsychology and what are some of the subgenres? Yeah, parapsychology is the uh, what we call also psi phenomena. So it's uh, all the experiences that you have beyond the uh, three-dimensional world, like the, the beyond the five senses that we all have, um, such as intuition, precognition, telepathy, things that cannot be explained uh, by uh, the physical laws. And there are things like, I mean, we can put a lot of uh, um, concepts under that umbrella. We can say things like remote viewing, and we can talk about things like telekinesis or psychokinesis, or some people refer to it as ESP. I mean, these are all parts of this of the parapsychology discussion, right? Yes, correct. Absolutely. It's a, so, in fact, in the film, uh, that's exactly what, you know, I cover. We go from... Um, uh, to remote viewing, which includes also telepathy because the two minds are connecting remotely. Um, you know, we cover t telekinesis. Uh, also, you know, as you saw at the end of the film, even being able to perceive without your eyes and mm -hmm. all kinds of abilities that transcend the physical world. So after we have that definition kind of put aside here, what is consciousness? Ah, <laughs> Uh, so, so it's it's uh, again it's two separate things. Consciousness is more um, of a substance. I want to say it's a form of energy that is fundamental. If we were thinking of it in linearly, like before and after, I would say that consciousness comes first, and then the physical world come, if you will, um, in the linear sense. But when you talk about telepathy or remote viewing, these are phenomena or abilities or mechanics of consciousness. So consciousness is the energy, the substance that can do telepathic communication, that can remote view, that can do telekinesis, so on and so forth. Now, this point was brought up in the film, and you just mentioned it, and we need clarification and a little bit more explanation. You said consciousness is a substance, and that's discussed in the film. Um, explain that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's hard to also find perfect English words, you know, to describe things that, to me, are not just spiritual, but it, it's almost like we're talking about 
um, like something before, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, before language, if you will. Mm-hmm. To me, uh, it's, it's, you can think of consciousness also as an essence, the essence of all of existence. So uh, it's a nuance, you know, is it essence or substance? But I like the word substance as well because um, it can, as a substance, it can permeate through everything. It, it, ha- it also can have a physical component, even though it's also it's like an essence. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's uh, very delicate be- as well, like I said, because we're using very limiting human language <laughs> yeah. to describe something that's bigger than, than that. Right. Well, I think we're writing this book as we talk. Um, you know, these conversations like this are starting to, to open up these ideas and these doors, and we haven't written the language yet to be able to explain them. But I think that's one of the things that your film does. It takes a giant leap forward in that direction. Yes, and, and also another thing that I want to say is, is uh, consciousness, to me, is something that you experience, you know, beyond the definition, uh, the analytical mind trying to define what it is. Of course, we can try to do that as we're doing right now. But um, to me, the most important thing in my career is the under- the, to, to really discern between knowledge and um, experience. It's one thing to understand a concept and another thing to experience experience the concept. And so if you think of consciousness and you try to describe it as an essence or a substance and it does this and it does that, intellectually it sort of makes sense. But if you try to experience (laughs) what consciousness is, your brain functions very differently. So from linear functioning, you know, as analytical functioning, when you're trying to find the word to describe the human language, all of that, your brain functions very linearly. But when you're experiencing something, I feel like your brain functions as a whole. It's like you switch to 100% capacity and you just merge with the information. You become consciousness. You become telepathy. You become the universe. You see, yeah. uh, are we going too far? With no, 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 this is, this is perfect. <laughs> but I, but I, I need, I need to address another uh, component of this. Um, there's been more and more talk about uh, the possibility of it, uh, reality not being what we think it is. And in fact, we might mm. be living in a matrix type world, or we might be in some type of simulation that is created uh, in in ways that we don't understand, but it's not necessarily a physical world. And that's one of the ideas addressed in the film as well. And in fact, there's discussion that we are actually only avatars that are kind of uh, working through um, what our consciousness provides for us. Talk about that idea, because this is quite fascinating. Yeah, Tom Campbell, uh, actually, when I talked to him, he says, uh, we are pieces of consciousness playing avatars in a virtual reality game yeah. we call this physical world. I love yeah. <laughs> that sentence. Uh, but honestly, I, it's not the virtual reality as in we're all inside the matrix and this is all, all an illusion and we're being played by a big computer. That's not what actually he means. Okay. Um, what is actually meant by this statement is more that we are pieces of consciousness, each one of us. We, we have our individual individuality actually as an individual consciousness but we're still part of a much larger consciousness and we're drawing information we're downloading if you will data um, from this larger consciousness um, that's also what explains how we can be tapped we're kind of entangled if you will Um, You know, that's why some people retrieve the same information at the same time, even though they don't know each other. That's what explains telepathy and so on and so forth. Because the larger consciousness contains all of this information and the potential information and the eventual information. So having said all of this, um, it's not that we are inside a computer and we're just kind of... um, it's a game, and, it, and the physical world doesn't exist. Because when you create your reality, when you focus your intention on something, then the result, the intention that you, um, to, uh, that you focused on happens. 
This means that the larger computer is not deciding the outcome. You are deciding the outcome. And that's precisely what this film demonstrates. Are we just being played by a large computer, or do we have any say in the matter? <laughs> and so when we do these experiments over and over and we can predict the outcome of an experiment, that way, you know, if I say I'm going to make this water, the pH of water go up this way or go down this way, I'm going to move this piece of paper to the right or to the left and I'm going to make it levitate or whatever. When I'm saying this and it happens, this means that my intention has the ability to create the reality that I choose. Therefore, the larger computer is not the one deciding. I am deciding. Does so, that make sense? Yeah, so, yeah. so when he says virtual, I think it's more to think of the larger uh, reality as malleable, like it's changing all the time. That's why we say it's virtual. It's like it's not finished. It's not static. It's constantly moving. Therefore, it's not finished, if you will. So how do we then uh, understand if, if I am looking at an object and someone else is looking at an object, we see the same object, we touch the object, we feel the same properties of that object, we, even if we might you know, have, have different ideas or if we have competing intentions about an outcome, um, you know, we both end up seeing the same outcome. Uh, how do we explain that in this idea? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you, you know, I mean, uh, how do you explain the physical world and with this idea? What happens is that the, you know, you've uh, or the idea of uh, that object, the, the table or what have you, already exists because somebody came before you and already had the idea of a table, and other people had already an idea of a table, so that you already know. Uh, so you know, multiply that by millions and thousands, you know billions of people over generations over, you know, since the beginning of time, um, thinking of what a table looks like and what it should feel like, this means that the concept of a table of this physical object exists so that when you and I look at it, we recognize that concept from a previous, if you will, from this memory bank which is the collective uh, consciousness or the universe, you know, the, the, the larger stream of consciousness. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But at, this, at, this, yeah. at the same time, one of the things that you demonstrate in the film through experimentation is that intention can affect the, rea uh, the physical world, reality. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have trouble understanding how that I, how that works. At the same time, um, as as you just said, if somebody you know came before me and perceived this object as a table, it's established as a table. I can't change yeah. that. I can't change that with my attention. At least I don't think I can. Yeah, exactly. So so the, now we're getting into a different subject. I'm uh, not different, but a related uh, topic, okay. which is uh, the world of probability and also. Um, the world of uncertainty. So, for example, if I want to, we both are looking at the table, we both acknowledge its presence, but then I want to put my hand through the table I, because for me, the table doesn't exist as a physical object, right? Okay. My intention mm -hmm. changes my reality, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the level of uncertainty, if you will, of my hand actually going through a piece of uh, a large, thick uh, <laughs> piece of wood is very, very high. The uncertainty is very, very high. So the, the odds of me succeeding at this is actually low. But, for example, you know, rotating a piece of paper or, lift, you know, kind of uh, making this, uh, something very light, you know, bending a spoon or whatever, has a lower level of uncertainty. So even though you and I are looking at the spoon, for example, I am still able to to move it and and bend it with my mind because the level of uncertainty is much lower if that makes sense. So so in other words, yes, technically we can still we are we are all looking and recognizing the physical world, but at the same time you still have the ability to change that within, you know, the level of uncertainty that you can uh, you know, uh, master, if you will. Does that make sense? Yep. And we're going to get into, well, I mean, it makes as much sense as my, my 
challenged brain can can uh, absorb <laughs> because a lot of these concepts are really really tough to get your you know mind around. Um, but but yeah. again. The film, Superhuman, does a great job of putting them into really uh, basic terms or basic uh, presentations so it's easy to under or easier anyway to understand them. Let's change the subject a little bit. One of the, um, one of the experiments that you did in the film, um, and it was with, um, I'm trying to remember the, the girl's name, Rachel uh, B- Brooke um, yeah. Smith, right? Is that the name? Yeah. Uh, she, yeah. And you did a remote viewing experiment. Lay out for us how that how that was set up and how it worked because it was the results were quite amazing. Yeah, that was incredible. So um, we invited Rachel. She had never ever done anything like it before, and uh, as you know, we had Paul H. Smith, who uh, was part of the government remote viewing program. So he literally uh, gave us like a crash course, like a two hour, um, you know, kind of just basic, like, this is how it works, and, you know, you focus this way, and you get information that way for a couple of hours. And and then we did what we call an outbounder experiment, meaning myself and um, a couple of the crew member, we went to a remote location, and Rachel was supposed to figure out where we were, basically describe uh, the location where we were and what we were doing. And just from these two hours um, of training, she was incredible. Like, she nailed it. Like, she could see, well, we went to a park, and she could see exactly, like, uh, you know, the carousel. She could see the colors. There was, like, a Christmas tree. Um, she nailed it. It was absolutely uh, incredible. Yeah, when she, when she said, I see, like, Christmas lights or something like that, and, and you know, you cut in the film to you sitting next to this uh Basically, it was a tree made of lights. It was it was like, you know, you think, how can this be happening? But it was happening in real time for you um, and her. And uh, it was remarkable. I mean, she must have been, and she seemed to be in the film, quite amazed at what happened. Yeah, she was like blown away. In fact, her reaction was hilarious, if you recall. And something really, really fun happened. Uh, I don't know if you remember the story of the, the hot drink. <laughs> yes, that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she picked. Uh, yeah, she she even picked up that. Um, you know, we stopped at a at a place and got coffee on the way, which we weren't supposed to do, which was a big no no. And so um, that um, she still was able to pick it up, which means that she was totally tuned in. She was really picking up information in real time. Um, so, and uh, another reason why I also invited uh, Rachel and, and, as you know, other guests in the film, I wanted to also show that it's not only certain people who have trained, who have done this before. I wanted to invite just anybody who has never tried anything to, uh, and don't forget, you know, you're, when you're filming, you have cameras, you have crew, you have, like, all the um, electromagnetic energy around you, the people kind of watching you. And so it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> and so for her to be able to do it, I thought was, uh, was amazing. It was. Do you know, did she have experiences prior to that experiment uh, that she shared with you, which made her a good candidate for this? Or was this the first time she'd ever tried anything like that? She had never tried anything like that, but we, her and I, of course, before uh, starting the filming, and when I picked her actually for the film, it was because um, she was very uh, into the, you know, like thinking positive, being positive in your life, like your mind affects your body, that sort of thing. So she was very open, but she had never, um, you know, done anything like this at all. No training. Um, you just mentioned guests that you had into the, in the program, people that you selected. And I just have to say that a couple of them are actually good friends of mine. Naomi Grossman and uh, Ben Hansen are both friends of mine. And I was really kind of surprised to see them both in the film, ah, but it, it was a lot of fun. You know, you know Naomi, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah Naomi is a, good, is a good friend. Um, back to the, the, the remote viewing idea. You, you kicked off that discussion with this uh, experiment. You demonstrated how it can work, particularly with someone who hasn't done it before. Um, but you're, you're, uh, scientific guest for that particular discussion had experiences with the U.S. military and the U.S. government and talked about how the uh, U.S. government and governments around the world have been experimenting, experimenting with and exploring this uh, concept to be used for all sorts of things, but particularly spying. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, the Stargate program was um, created out of the Cold War because they discovered that Russia was uh, using soldiers, training soldiers, to spy on other governments to retrieve information for military purposes, obviously. And so um, so the U.S. said, of course, we need to be doing that. <laughs> so they created a program called the Stargate Program, and uh, they started training soldiers to basically uh, become psychic spies, to tap to tap into intelligent informa- intelligence, actually, um, retrieve intelligence from... from um, the Russian government uh, to find out about their military bases or whatever they were planning. And uh, it was very successful because, first of all, it ran for about 20 years, and I think it was billions of dollars that they spent. So you would think that it was working somehow. And, in fact, uh, we show in the film actual documents. Uh, it was the time of Carter uh, where um, this uh, information was given to um, – Congress and actually it affected policy. Um, they were going to create, you know, they were uh, they used the remote viewing exercise to uh, to actually withdraw from. Um, um, for, I don't remember the details. To be yeah, honest, there was there was, was a missile system in which yeah, a system, yeah, in exactly. in which uh, they had a, they had tried to come up with a way that they could d- uh, avoid detection by the Russians, uh, the Soviets yeah. at the time. And they came up yeah. with this system by where they would move it through these tunnels, the missile, so the, the Soviets would never know exactly where the missile was. But then they they tried the remote viewing experiment, and they, they were able to locate it 100% of the time. So they recognized, yeah. wow, this is not going to work. If this remote viewing thing is what it seems to be, they'll be able to find it regardless. So they scrapped the whole program. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. So it did affect policy. It was very, very instrumental in decision making. And so, yeah, this means that it works definitely. It, but huh? I think it, it kind of, go ahead. No, no, no. Finish. I was just going to say, but I think it started to take a different turn, if I understand it, because you know, different folks uh, who were in the program uh, tell us the, kind of the story from their own angle. But I think it started to take a different angle uh, at one point because they started to be asked to retrieve information like uh, actual documents and um, f- do things that are not just remote viewing but more remote influencing, meaning um, – from afar, like kind of uh, affect computers and machines, and you know, which means that you could blow off a missile remotely, which could be very, very, very scary and dangerous. Uh, so I think, uh, I think at that point, um, you know, Congress pulled the plug, something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how many governments uh, are around the world are involved in this activity that you're aware of, um, particularly when? Uh, you know, they were all kind of hopping on board. I know I know China was mentioned. I know, obviously, the Soviet Union, the United States. But I imagine it's more than that. Oh, definitely. I would say definitely uh, China for sure still. Um, Japan, uh, Israel, uh, also I'm sure Russia. Oh, I mean, UK, France. I mean, yeah. I mean like uh, <laughs> if, if, if the big uh, governments are all going to be doing it, uh, you know, it's like a, uh, like a no-brainer, right? Yeah, are we, st- one, are we, st- one, yeah, are we still doing it? I don't, I don't hear about it as much contemporarily. I think they are, mm-hmm. uh, especially the Chinese. Um, I know for sure that they are. Is it is it is is this something that you believe, particularly when it rises to the level of a U.S. intelligence program, is it something that is consistent enough that it can it can be used with regularity for this type of application? Or in your experience, is it a little too random for that? You know, I'm not really sure, but uh, I think there's so much conflict and so much, you know, kind of. Um, confusion, I think, within the government, and especially with what's happening right now in the world. I'm not really sure if um, this type of program could be used consistently, like you're saying. I think it's, um, it's only when it's needed and, you know, to achieve a specific, like, pro- uh, probably, for example, for corporate spying, it's still yeah. happening. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Corporate spying. They'll do anything to get competitor information, right? Um, 
Yeah. What is um what is the effect of a near death experience on all of this, particularly somebody who has these sensitivities? Does it heighten them? Yes, of course, absolutely, because you, going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's not just the knowledge, it's the experience. You literally live through it. It it becomes a cellular thing. And so when you have a near-death experience, you actually experience cellularly what it's like to be on the other side and uh, have this bird's eye view and come back. So this is a very, um, you know, traumatic, but in a good way, actually. It, it depends. I've seen sometimes a, um, a uh, sometimes when this experience, out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences are actually traumatic. Uh, but in general, you learn and you see things that you couldn't have seen otherwise, and you come back with a whole different perspective on your life and usually with new abilities as well. So uh, to me, it's uh, very, very, very helpful. Yeah, frequently we'll have folks on the program who are um, either uh, exper- or, or, or practicing mediums or they are uh, psychics or whatever it happens to be, and often their story begins with a near-death experience. And when they came back, they these sensitivities were very much heightened and they weren't even aware of them prior. Uh, so that is definitely something that plays out there. Um, another expert you had in the documentary talked about the idea of spin in other words uh you know the 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 universe is spinning the galaxy is spinning the solar system is spinning the planet is spinning our cells are spinning this is part of this consciousness fabric explain talk about that a little bit oh my god i love your questions (laughs) these are very very profound uh subjects i think because uh, this is uh, Rudy Shield. He's the astrophysicist of, uh, from Harvard Smithsonian, and what he mentions in the um, in the film has to do uh, with the spin uh, that is part of the entire universe. Like you were saying, we see spin at the universe level, at the planetary level, at solar system level, but you keep coming going down to the from the macro to the micro level. Our physical body, our our cells are vibrating. Everything is vibrating, even um, the phys- some physical objects that appear to be finite and still are, you know, if you had to zoom in, if you will, there's still a form of vibration. So the reason why uh, this is such an important um, component of um, the nature of reality is because you start to notice that there's coherence. This means that uh, from your the the cells vibrating within your body to the space around you to the planets around you, if everything is vibrating um, at a different ratio, um, at, at a uh, coherent ratio, then you become coherent with the universe. And so, um, in the context of the film, he was talking about consciousness waves that consciousness also have a wave function and that wave function is also a spin function and so if the spin function of consciousness is coherent with my brain and your brain then our brains become coherent so that whatever information i have in my brain gets projected in yours instantaneously because we become in re- basically re- in resonance with each other um, my brain waves um, and consciousness waves are uh, coherent with your the spin of your consciousness waves i find that concept fascinating and very very profound so i'm so glad you brought it up we're talking tonight with caroline Corey, filmmaker author and uh, her latest documentary is called Superhuman, The Invisible Made Visible. And uh, it's it's the subject of our discussion tonight. And uh, Caroline, before we continue, where can people actually see or buy the film? Yeah, they can go to superhumanfilm.com and they can actually pre-order it right now. Uh, the, the good news is that they get to download it and they get all kinds of bonus clips if they do that. Uh, but, it, but it becomes available for regular sale on July 14th as well. But I don't think they get that option at that time. I think it's a part of the pre-order. So it's superhumanfilm.com. Superhuman, and, and the bonus material is part of the pre-order. Yes. Okay. Um, entanglement. That's another idea that's introduced in the film and discussed uh, in relationship to consciousness. What is entanglement? Yes. Yeah, so actually, 
actually, this was demonstrated um, scientifically that, you know, they were observing particles, uh, the behavior of particles, and they noticed that uh, the um, two particles, even though they were spread up in space, they were not connected at all. The properties of one particle can be shared uh, with another particle at a distance. So that's it means that they were connected somehow, and this is how the concept of entanglement came about. So this means that the two particles are entangled. And so um, we bring that up in the film because we're saying that if actual particles are exchanging properties at a distance, why is it so crazy to think that our minds are exchanging properties at a distance, our brains are exchanging properties at a, at a distance? It's just an extension of that concept that has been proven uh, scientifically, actually, entanglement, so that our, um, the particles of our brains are actually entangled, and that's what we call telepathy. I, um, I may have this wrong, but was that... Um part of the or, or part of the concept involved in the double slip experiment um or was that something not different quite. okay no, that's different uh yeah the double slit experiment demonstrated that um when you projected photons of particles through a double slit um it would behave differently depending on the observer if there was somebody observing or not so what happens is that they started shooting a bunch of uh, photon, par um, photon particles through double slits, and normally they should create like two lumps of um, particles on the other side. Um, so they, they noticed that when nobody was watching, it would create a diffraction pattern, meaning a bunch like a wave, if you will. But then when somebody was watching, the particles would create. Um, a particle distribution, meaning two lumps of particles stuck together. So this experiment then demonstrated that the observer was affecting the behavior of the particle, which is huge because this, this, is, this, is, this means that your intention, your presence, having somebody there look at something changes the property of light. So uh, that was the that was the double through. Yeah, and that is yeah. that is huge. Actually, saying it's huge is a bit of an understatement. Um, right. Because not only not only was that experiment they, there wasn't an in, there wasn't an effort to change what was happening. It was just the 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 act of observing. Right. Exactly, and actually observing and. Uh, uh, taking down the data also changed the behavior, which was another thing that Tom Campbell explained so well, that observing was one thing, but then uh, actually collecting the data was, uh, was also important. So uh, this is huge. So think about this. This means that, um, again, light, meaning these are particles, photon particles. Right. So it's something that is physical in a sense because it's a particle and you are looking at it and you're changing its pattern, its behavior. Um, and when you write down the data, you collect the data, it changes again. It's to me, it's, it just, like mind blowing, like how could that not be validation that consciousness and the intention of the observer, which is us affects the physical world. With the exception of saying that consciousness is affecting that, I mean, that's, that's one way to explain yeah. it, but it doesn't give us a real explanation. Do we have any idea of what the force is that makes the connection between observer and particle? It's, it's the, the, the intention of the, of the uh, I mean, the consciousness directed uh, at the particle is the intention, meaning like you want to look at the, the, uh, the particle and you want it to change. So that your intention, that's what also is fascinating about this and mind-blowing, in fact, that your intention actually is very important, not just looking at it, but your intention. Um, so, so that, I mean, you know, it, it's um, your, what, what, what's happening is that you're 
actually demonstrating the effect of consciousness. You're not demonstrating consciousness itself, if that makes sense. Because consciousness is, is an essence, it's an energy that um, people haven't been able to actually measure itself. You're measuring the effect of it and then deduce that that is what consciousness is. There, is, there, is, there are so many ideas that you present in the film. And even though you went into this film already knowing uh, the, the reality of some of this because you personally experienced it, as you were going through these experiments one by one and watching whether it was yourself as the subject or someone else as the subject, were you amazed at what you were seeing? Yes, definitely. Even though, for example, I have done, um, you know, telekinesis in person uh, with the target or in uh, long distance many, many, many times. But then when we were filming, for example, there were other people there and all kinds of stuff started to happen. <laughs> and we had to kind of like, wait, wait, is that, was that me or was that you? Was that all of us? And, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, of course we had to edit it down at the end and just kind of, <laughs> cut to the chase and show what, what needs to, to be shown on film. But all kinds of weird stuff started to happen. So we had to kind of, every time, even though I'm used to doing this, I've done it many times, you know, sometimes I'd have to tell some people, like, you know, the production assistant or some people who were uncomfortable with the process, like, hey, can you just go to the other room for a second and, like, check your texts and check your emails for a while while we do this, you know, <laughs> just because we realized that some people's intention and, and focus was messing things up or changing the effect, or it was just like really, really uh, very interesting. Another experiment that you did, which had amazing outcomes, was the pH experiment with water. Tell our, tell our listeners what that was about. Yeah, I wanted to do this experiment because, as you know, we hear a lot about alkaline water being good for our health. In fact, in fact you buy bottled uh, water, 9 plus pH or whatever, for $8, and, <laughs> you know, because we know when the body is alkaline, it's very hard for a virus or a bacteria to survive. So um, because of that, I wanted to do this experiment. In fact, I'm not the first one, obviously, other people have have done this experiment before, William Tiller is one of them. And so um, I wanted to actually demonstrate if this is possible, how this could be possible. And so we, um, we did this experiment with water. Uh, what happens also for those who are listening, when we do experiments scientifically, we don't just like take a sample and try to change the pH, for example, in this case, we take um, a measurement over several hours, which is a baseline to make sure, okay, well, it is 7.4 or whatever it is, for a long period of time, and then exactly, let's say, at 1 o'clock, this is when the experiment starts. And so I focus my intent on it and for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then we see if there's a change, and then I stop. So then we observe and see if the numbers go back to the baseline. So that's how we do an experiment, and, and then we repeat it over and over, and that's how we know that this was the effect of the intention or not. Uh, or if it was random. And so in the film, um, I, the, the, we took the measurement of the water over several hours and then even on film three times over and over. And then once we took that measurement, it was like 7.4 or something, and I attempted to lower the pH. And so I just focused on it, and we literally started to see the pH uh, meter drop go lower and lower and lower and lower. And so, uh, so again, I think it took me about 10 minutes, I want to say, for that one. Um, and this was, to me, very, very important, again, to demonstrate that if you can do this to a bottled water, then you can do it to your body. You can change the chemistry of your body simply by you know, intending just the way I, I did it. That's why I think it's very relevant. Yeah, it is. And, and we're, we're going to go to break here. But when we come back, I want to pick it up there because this gets into all uh, sorts of uh, very interesting ideas in relationship to health and genetics and other things. Be sure to check out the second segment of this interview on Beyond Reality Paranormal. 
Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.